1516, Thomas More, the uh, renowned lawyer and judge and statesman and author, Thomas More invented a new word for the title of the book that he'd just written. The word was utopia. His book describes uh, an ideal land, an ideal society with little crime or violence or poverty or anything else to spoil it. And as an opposite to that idea of utopia, various writers have used the word dystopia, which literally in Greek would mean bad place, dystopia. Uh, to describe a nation that is perhaps full of fear or distress or tyranny, a place in decline. Many people would say that Britain uh, is well on the way from the good old days, uh, though they were never perfect, of course, but headed towards a dystopian society where we are less wealthy, less healthy, less happy, and less free. And no doubt there are many reasons for such a decline. You can analyze it in lots of ways. But is there a deep, below the surface reason for that? The book of Judges chronicles the, the rapid descent of Israel into a dystopian mess. The country became a bad place. We've read in the last few uh, weeks about the, uh, the judges or the leaders. God blessed Israel through them, but as we've seen, they were, they were far from perfect. And we've thought about how God's people needed a far more righteous judge and savior, one whose leadership might actually last longer than just a few years or a few decades. But most tragic of all, as we've been through this book, we've seen how the Israelite people who had experienced the kindness of God in bringing them out of slavery and in taking them across uh, the River Jordan, and they had seen his fearful power and holiness at Mount Sinai, and yet, again and again, they could turn away from the Lord so quickly. And now we reach these last few chapters of the book. There are no more named judges to come. Uh, but in this account, we see the corruption of the hearts of the people working its way through everything. In chapter 17 and 18, then, we see this dystopian, this bad place culture. We see it in a single family, in the family of Micah, and we see it on a much wider scale in the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan, uh, we've just heard read from chapter 18, are the tribe that is, is acting like the tough guys with the menacing words. And yet, chapter 18 is also a record of their weakness and humiliation, as we shall see. They, as Brian said, they had failed to take over the land that had been allocated to that tribe. When Joshua allocated the land, there was an area in the middle of Canaan, roughly, that was allocated to the tribe of Dan but they had failed to conquer that in obedience to the Lord. And so instead, they set their sights on this town called Laish, which is right up at the very top of the land of Canaan. And they're only willing to uh, consider um, conquering that city after they've sent spies to check out that it's not going to be too hard for them. Well, those people who know they are weak often make up for that by finding somebody even weaker who they in turn can bully. And that's what the Danites do with Micah. Chapter 18, verse 16, we see 600 armed men standing guard at the gate of Micah's house while others go in to steal his household gods. And when Micah and his neighbors catch up with this thieving tribe, they are threatened with violence. This is the language of of thugs, isn't it? Chapter 18, verse 25. Don't argue with us, or some hot-tempered men will attack you, and you and your family will lose your lives. It's a very tragic picture. Uh, Micah cannot stop them from stealing what belongs to him, and nobody else 
is about to intervene on his behalf. You might think of how some people in our society are also afraid because of where they live, of even going out after dark. You might think of the recent reports of shoplifting in our big cities that's just been going on in broad daylight with nobody apparently able to lift a finger to stop it. Or you might think of the, the blatant lies of those people who, uh, through fraud or uh, through scams, you, you know, just lie without shame. And you might think, yeah, they're, they're, our culture is not so very different from what was beginning to happen in Israel. But why is life like that for us? And why is life like that for these Israelites at this time? What's at the root of this dystopia? And I think what we see in these two chapters is it's about worship. The worship of a people will determine the character of that people. Who they worship and how they worship will determine the people that they become. So we're going to think about man-made religion, first of all, at home. We'll look at chapter 17 and see this in the, in the house, in the family, in the household of Micah. Chapter 17. There are, you may have thought, thought this as it was being read, there are, there are a number of things that seem just wrong in what's going on in the family of Micah. Verse 2, he had stolen... 1,100 shekels of silver from his own mother. Uh, the footnote tells us that is about 28 pounds or 13 kilograms of silver. I checked the price of silver yesterday. If I got it right, it's about 8,000 pounds in today's money that was taken from his mum. And then when, that's, uh, when he owns up, we see, well, what happens? She had, she had spoken a curse over whoever had taken this money, and then when she discovered it was her son, she spoke a blessing, presumably to try and cancel out the curse. But there's no mention here of repentance or consequences. According to the Old Testament law that they've been given, those who steal have to pay back more, sometimes double, they don't just return what was taken. And then they're meant to sacrifice a guilt offering before the Lord. And none of that is mentioned. But it is the worship that goes on in Micah's house that really stands out in this chapter. Remember, these are Israelites. Just a few generations before, the nation had stood at Mount Sinai and trembled while God gave them his law through Moses. Had they forgotten what God had commanded them, or were they deliberately ignoring him? Verse 4, Micah's mother gives some of the returned silver to the silversmith who made them into a carved image and a cast idol. The second of the Ten Commandments, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And then we see verse 5, Micah had a shrine. Literally, it says a house of gods. A house of gods within his house. But God, of course, had established another house, a house of God. A, a, the tent, the tabernacle that was in Shiloh, later the temple that was in Jerusalem. That is the house of God. That was where God dwelt. That was where they were to go to offer sacrifices. And that house of God had to be built strictly in accordance with the plans, the instructions that Moses was given because it was meant to be a faithful copy or shadow of heaven. But here's Micah just building his own idea of a house of God's at home. And then verse 5, we see Micah goes even further. He installs one of his sons to be his priest. Well, God's law said that priests could only come from the tribe of Levi and they had to be descended from Aaron. And they had particular responsibilities in the tabernacle and as teachers of God's law in the towns of Israel. Nothing is said about priests serving at a shrine in somebody's private house. This is all 
man-made religion. It's a DIY kind of worship. This is saying, yes, we're going to carry on worshiping the Lord, Yahweh, who brought us out of Egypt, but we'll do it our way. We'll copy perhaps the worship of the nations around, or we'll use our imagination, our ideas, and we'll do it that way, rather than saying, how does the Lord require us to worship him? And then verse six says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit, which is a pretty good summary of the book of Judges. God's not given them a king yet, um, but maybe the, the deeper meaning of this really is that, of course, God was supposed to be their king and they've rejected him as their king. They want to do their own thing instead. And then from verse seven onwards, a Levite passed by looking for a place to stay and Micah persuades him to stay in his house and be his priest. Uh, his son presumably gets the sack and this guy is installed instead for um, 10 shekels of silver a year and clothes and food. Now we're gonna find out later that this man is not descended from Aaron. He has no right to be a priest of the Lord. And even if he was from the right family, he has no authority to be this kind of private priest serving at a shrine in somebody's home. And in all this, Far from being perhaps a little bit worried that he's ignoring God's instructions, Micah declares complacently in verse 13, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. Where did he get that idea from? As Samuel will later on say to King Saul when he foolishly decided, decided to ignore God's instructions. These, these are Samuel's words. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's what really matters. Um, I have a, a blog. Um, there's a link to it on our church website. And on it, I, put, I just put the letters that I write each month to the village newsletters. Um, so if you're short of something to read, you can go back and read. There's about 10 years worth of them there now. But also on there, uh, there's some pages on one or two other things. And one of them is all about worship. And it's got some of the little talks that I've given here in church uh, a number of years ago now. Um, and this is what's on the, the page all about worship. Why are we here in church worshipping the Lord together? Because he has invited us. So the first question we must ask when we think about public worship is not, what kind of service would I like? What would my children like? What's been the tradition of the church? Or what would appeal to visitors? Rather, we should ask, what pleases the Lord who calls us to worship him? What does the Lord require of us? And we can only answer that from the Bible as the Spirit opens God's word to us, because we have no other access to the mind of God on this or on anything else. Man-made religion at home. Chapter 18, though, is gonna show us that the problem in Israel goes far beyond just what's happening in one family. Man-made religion at large, um, that, picture um, on the screen is uh, uh, drawn by Jean de Brunhoff, who um, wrote, uh, what was that elephant? Um, I, I quoted in, Barber the Elephant. He wrote and illustrated it. So there we are. There's him illustrating the Danites steal Micah's idols uh, from 1904. Anyway, chapter 18, we see 600 men from the tribe of Dan armed for battle, passing by Micah's house uh, on their way to this city that they hope to capture. Uh, and they persuade the Levite, with promise of better pay, to leave Micah's house and come with them instead. Uh, verse 19, chapter 18, verse 19. Be quiet, don't say a word, come with us and be our father and priest 
isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priest rather than just one man's household? So they take the priest, but they also steal Micah's household gods. Micah, the man who stole from his mum, is now robbed. And when they've conquered Laish, they rename that city Dan, they rebuild it, and they set up for themselves the idols there, and they install this Levite as the priest for the tribe. But before they get there, when these idols are stolen from Micah, he calls his neighbors together to try and get them back. They chase after the Danites. It's interesting, isn't it, that the neighbors are willing to go with Micah. I think that's a sign that they don't seem to have a problem with him having household gods. Maybe they had gods in their own house as well, or maybe they shared in the worship in Micah's house. They certainly seem happy to attempt to get the gods back. Why aren't they instead horrified at what Micah was doing? Why aren't they thinking, well, if the gods are gone, that's great, because we should never have had them anyway. Deuteronomy 27 verse 15 couldn't put it more clearly than this. Cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of the craftsman's hands, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, Amen. So no sense of alarm apparently at what's going on in Micah's house, no fear that Micah is going to bring down God's judgment on his family and those who follow his ways. And then the tribe of Dan, of course, act in the same way. They don't seem to be shocked when they get to this house and see that man-made religion has taken root in Israel. Instead, they steal the idol so that they can go and set them up and use them. And they take the priest to do the same thing that that was done in Micah's house. And so this city of Dan, right up there in the top of Israel, becomes a center of corrupt and disobedient worship. Perhaps that's why later on when Jeroboam became king of the northern, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, that he decided to use Dan as one of the centers of his corrupt worship that he introduced, complete with a golden calf to put in the city of Dan. And then the, the big shock at the end of, the end of uh, chapter 18, verse 30 There the Danites set up for themselves the idols and, and now for the first time, this Levite is named. Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses. And his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. Even Moses' grandson has become corrupt and disobedient ignoring the commands that God had given to his own grandfather. At the time of the Reformation in England and on the continent, uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a lot of discussion about worship. In many ways, it was the central issue. How should we be worshipping the Lord? Because they could see that many practices had grown up in the church of the day that were not commanded in scripture and in many cases were opposed to what scripture taught. And so the reformers wrestled with this. They didn't agree all the time. <clears throat> they had all kinds of discussions about you know, what was it that scripture commanded, what was permitted and, and having worked that out realizing they needed to get rid of the rest, whether that was furniture from the church or particular clothes or particular words. But although they didn't always agree, and in England we definitely had those discussions about what Reformation should look like, yet they were all trying to do the same thing, which was to say we need to get back to what the Bible says and worship God in the way that he has told us to worship him. So they tackled various things, uh, a lot around um, the communion service and what our understanding of that should be. They tackled what you might call sacramentalism, that belief that it's the externals, the rituals, that's the all-important thing rather than the Lord Jesus himself. And if you think about our day, where are the dangers? Perhaps most in what we might call 
collectivism, the idea that worship is all about me as an individual. It's, it's my feelings, it's about what I prefer, rather than digging in the scriptures to see what it is that God requires of us. So we've thought about man-made religion, and then just finally, the man-made religion dystopia. I realize that's not very clearly phrased. The dystopia that comes from man-made religion. Moses had told the people that they were crossing the Jordan to enter into a good land, a land that the Lord your God cares for. But by their unfaithfulness to God and their disobedience to his commands, particularly about worship, they turned it into a bad land, a dystopia. To worship a God other than the true and living God is to be disconnected from the truth. Uh, he is the creator. He is the only savior. And to worship God other than he has commanded us to worship him is in the end to worship ourselves and to try and make God as we want him to be and not respond to him as he is. And as I said earlier, how a people worship ends up determining the character of that people. How a nation worships or what a nation worships will end up determining the character of that nation. The, the cultus, that is the accepted and established patterns of worship, will determine the culture, that is, the beliefs, the values, the behavior of a people. Bad worship will produce a bad land. And you think about not just what is wrong with the church, but think about what people in, in our society are worshiping. What are they living for? Well, that's gonna determine where we end up as a nation. Bad worship will produce a bad land where people live in fear and distress, a land where people are without a king and everyone does what he wants. How do we see the, the effect of this bad worship working out in the Israelites? I think two things in chapter 18 particularly point to it. Have a look at chapter 18, verse 24, and we see this rather tragic, pathetic picture of Micah after his gods have been stolen from him. He replied, you took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? You know, why is he so upset? These gods that were stolen, they can't have been real gods. How could anyone steal them if they were real gods? They, they don't have any power. And yet Micah feels he's got nothing left to live for because the gods have gone. And he lives in a nation where these thuggish Danites can take what they want and no one can stop them. His gods have let him down and he is destitute. But you also see the Danites as a people in deep need. Uh, as a tribe, they seem to have become this weak and cowardly tribe. They, they didn't take the part of land they were meant to. They, they now defeat a city, but only because it's undefended and weak. And they need courage. They need reforming power, but they're not going to find it from the worship of their silver gods up there in the city of Dan. What they need is an encounter with the real God and to be brought back to worship him as he has commanded. If they would submit to him as he truly is, then they might receive courage and gladly follow him. And if we submit to the Lord as he truly is, we will receive his courage to follow Christ in the way of the cross. I don't know what you think is the problem in our country at the moment. Could it be that the deep uh, problem at root is our worship? The worship within our churches? the worship of the people as a whole, what it is that they give their lives to. When true worship and submission to the Lord departs from a family or from a church or from a nation, then disaster is not far off because worship will determine 
the character of a people and the health of a nation. So let's make this our aim, to please the true and living God by our worship of him, whether that's in public worship or the way that we live our lives, and to pray for our nation to return to its senses, to return to a true worship of the living God. Shall we pray together?